Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be watching from. We're delighted that you could join us for this very special webinar. If you don't mind, while we're waiting for others to pop on, just drop in chat where you're listening from. Let's see what parts of uh, the country or the world that we have listeners attending. Iowa, welcome. I'm in Florida myself. New Hampshire, right here. Helen's New Hampshire. All right, we're covering some of the country. <laughs> Welcome to everyone jumping on. Oh, wow. Look at that number going up, Kelly. Now I can see it. I wasn't paying attention to that. That's awesome. Wonderful. Such, a, such an exciting topic, Helen. We are so glad that you're here. Welcome to everyone just jumping on. If you don't mind, tell us where you're where you're listening from, drop it in chat or Facebook Live comments. And kind of bonus points if you want to, to share with us if you have seen your dogs in your household right now. Welcome, UNC Chapel Hill. We should have like a, especially it's a multi-dog thing. We should have like a t-shirt for the person who has the most senior dogs in their home that would be fun. definitely definitely yes <laughs> i i just have two so i'm on the low end helen you might win i'm not sure I, <laughs> no i was looking at some of the, the on your facebook when you posted it and someone said they had like 18 and i was like oh my god i'm slacking i only have 14 i need to get four more by the time i give this workshop <laughs> all right i think it can be arranged so welcome los angeles and maryland and all those other Everyone from across the, the country, there's Florida, Wisconsin, welcome everyone. So hello and welcome to the Gray Muzzle Organization's monthly webinar. These sessions are open to everyone and are focused on providing you with the valuable content related to the love and well-being of senior dogs. My name is Kelly Chicos and I am a very proud member of the Gray Muzzle Organization's Volunteer Board of Directors. And I've been on the board for about two and a half years now. And I would like to take a quick moment to thank each and every one of you for your support. Whether you have donated $1 or $1,000, if you follow us on social media, if you like and share our post, if you attend these webinars, maybe you support the vendors who support us, Maybe you volunteer for Gray Muzzle or one of our grantees. Whatever it is, in whatever manner you support us, we are so grateful. Thank you so much for helping give senior dogs a second chance at life, love, health, and happiness. They all deserve it, that's for sure. Well, in case you haven't heard, your support and generosity helped make 2022 another record-setting year for the Gray Muzzle Organization. You allowed us the true honor and privilege of awarding $705,000 to 78 very deserving animal welfare organizations across the United States, including Puerto Rico, but also in Canada. And so these amazing animal welfare organizations in turn used that grant funding to save and improve the lives of 3,300 senior dogs in 2022. Oh my goodness. Please give yourselves a, a virtual high five or pat on the back, even a hug, because we certainly are very grateful and appreciate that you made this possible. Your donations so far have totaled $3.8 million to senior dogs since our founding in 2008. Thank you. Well, before I turn the floor over to our very special guest, I would like to remind participants that this webinar is scheduled for an hour and Helen will present for about 40 or 45 minutes and she's reserved the last part of today's session for all of your questions and all of your comments. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on graymuzzle.org, our website at the end of today's program, as well as on YouTube. So if you have any questions or comments for our presenter, please feel free to drop those in the Zoom chat box, or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, just put those in the comments, and Amanda and I are keeping an eye out for those comments and questions, and then we'll share them with Helen at the end of today's webinar. All right, well, folks, 
at Gray Muzzle, we get to meet a lot of incredible people. And we get to hear so many amazing, happy ending stories about deserving senior dogs. Let me tell you, today is no exception. The word incredible really should be today's presenter's middle name because she is a very special lady who is truly a hero to senior dogs. We are so honored to welcome Helen St. Pierre as today's webinar facilitator. And Helen is here today to talk about multi-senior dog households. As mentioned, I have one myself. And that is something she certainly knows a thing or two about because after all, Helen is a certified behavior consultant and trainer. She has been training dogs for over 20 years and has her own training facility in Concord, New Hampshire. With the support of her family, Helen also runs her own senior and hospice dog nonprofit called, get this, Old Dogs Go to Helen. Absolutely beautiful. Old Dogs Go to Helen. So after today's webinar, please check out her website and look at the faces of the countless senior dogs and terminally ill dogs whom Helen has helped give a safe, loving, comfortable, and spoiled place to call home during their final time on earth. But consider yourself warned, you're going to want tissues handy. This beautiful story. <laughs> Helen, thank you so much for what you do. And thank you for being here today to share your wisdom with the extended Gray Muzzle family. Please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Helen St. Pierre. Hi, guys. <laughs> Can I start, Kelly? Yes, yes please. It's all, all right, yours. Cool. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name, as Kelly so wonderfully uh, introduces, Helen St. Pierre, and I am the owner and uh, dog trainer at No Monkey Business Dog Training. But more importantly, I'm here today as the uh, founder and owner of my senior dog uh, sanctuary called Old Dogs Go to Helen. And um, I have been working with senior dogs for a very long time. In fact, my work with dogs in general started in the shelter rescue environment and sort of graduated to more training and behavior. Year, but I have always kept my foot in the door of shelter work. I'm at the our local shelter every single week doing evaluations and um, really fell into uh, bringing home the hospice or very old uh, super, super seniors from the shelter uh, because I knew nobody was going to want to adopt them. When I would go in to do my evaluations and we would get a senior dog in, I would be the one that would bring it home. And uh, over time, as one does with senior dogs, because they're like potato chips, in my opinion, you can't have just one, we would start taking in more and more and um, began to create our uh, organization that we have now called Old Dogs Go to Helen. I'm going to show you lots of pictures and videos in just a second, um, uh, and I'll go to my PowerPoint. Um, but now, as a result, we have a very, very diverse uh, multi-family, uh, multi-dog group. We have 14 dogs in our sanctuary for our senior dogs, but we also have 12 of our own personal dogs that live in our uh, main home, but we intermix the dogs quite frequently. Um, and I've done a lot of talks about multi-dog households in general, just for uh, families with multiple dogs, not necessarily seniors. Um, but in my work in taking on multiple senior dogs at the same time, I found that a lot of the same rules apply, uh, but some of them have definitely changed as well. And I kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of a taste of what that would look like. It's it's not a ton of time. I was saying earlier, like I could talk about senior dogs and old dogs and multiple dog households and dog interactions for literally days. Um, but I want to give you some of the basics of things to consider with a multi-dog household, especially a multi-senior dog household, or even just a senior dog and young dog household. So I'm going to go ahead and go to share screen now. And hopefully, there we go. It will work for me. Slideshow. Play from the start. Yay. I hope we can all see this. So yeah, um, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Kelly. So um, these are my, this is my regular crew, I should say. These are my regular dogs that aren't oldies um, or dogs that I have had since puppyhood. Some of them are rescues and some of them um, are not. Uh, but these are my 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 regular dogs. And then um, I just wanted to show you some of the images of my multi-dog household over the years. So I started, my very first dog that I started with was a, was a Papillon. 
And very quickly, I was like, oh, I, I need more than one of these. And then I had two. And literally within a year of having a dog, I had a multi-dog household. So multi-dog households have been something that I've had now for 21 years. I absolutely, I, I wouldn't know how to not have a multi-dog household. Um, so it comes very, very natural. And it's sort of this progression look like there's two, then there's three. And oh my God, now there's four. And, and it just, it's like adding water. Um and so and what Kelly was saying, here's my old dogs go to Helen um, and sort of the dogs portion. It wasn't like one old dog goes to Helen. Dogs became a plural very, very quickly when the community and even a lot of New England started to learn that there was this lady up in New Hampshire that if you had an old dying dog at the shelter, she would take take them on. Um, and that meant in many ways that I had to change a lot of my environment considerations and a lot of things. And I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. Um, but here is my old dog sanctuary right now. In fact, that was this was taken just a couple of uh, days ago, last a couple of nights ago. Um, so here are a few of my kids. Um, I could go through all of my dogs um, and tell you all their ailments, but I will tell you in here, we've got Mr. Fletch. He is a blind and deaf senior um, Shih Tzu. We have Bonnie and Clyde, two uh, 14-year-old chihuahuas that came up to me uh, from a cruelty case. Sophie here, she we don't know her age. She's definitely a senior. She is in renal failure. Lola, or house mouse, has uh, cancer in her um, abdomen. Um, and she is, we think, around 13 to 14 years old. Terrence is around 18, a little chihuahua here who has a tumor on his spine. We have Moxie, who's in heart failure. Peanut, who has heart failure um, and a really nasty uh, collapsing trachea. You'll hear some of that in the videos. I'm sorry. There's no way to, <laughs> to stop it. Just sounds like a little goose. Jackson, who has thyroid issues and is a 16-year-old puggle. Gerald, who is a 13-year-old pity. And then there's more behind me that you can't see in the camera, but just an example of the very varied, rich <laughs> tapestry of our old dogs that we have in our sanctuary. My sanctuary is just one large room um, and it goes, it's got a ramp that goes out to a fully fenced in area. And this is specifically for the old dogs only. Now we do bring them into our home as well, um, at, you know, to, to sit by the fire or if they need medical attention that evening, especially some of our dogs that need fluids or uh, we're really watching for their breathing patterns or anything like that. But this sanctuary, this space that we uh, have built for them, we actually bought this house specifically for um, so that they could have a space to just be um, together. Um, and some of the ones that we've lost recently that I absolutely um, love, I've put some of their pictures in here and I'm not going to go into every one of them individually because I will start crying and then you won't understand anything I'm saying. Um, but <laughs> I can go a little bit now into what we're going to cover uh, first and foremost. So when we talk about multi-dog households, um, a lot of the conversations that I have with clients on a daily basis with behavior problems, uh, when they're dealing with multi-dog um, households that aren't going well, um, is talking about the personality requirements that is needed for multi-dog households. Um, and I think the same thing uh, definitely applies when you're dealing with seniors, although on a lesser scale. But I am going to explain what I mean by requirements that are needed for multiple dogs um, in households. And I I'm going to go over that in a minute when I show you some of these uh, pictures of my dogs. I'm going to show you and talk about environmental setup and management and things that are really important with senior dogs and multi-dog households to consider to lessen conflict of what to do when there can be issues or what certain things can cause problems between um, old dogs. Um, and, and young dogs, or sometimes uh, just all multiple dogs can really struggle with certain things that we don't even consider being a problem, like a doorway in our environments and how we can mitigate that. Resources that dogs find valuable. So resources like food and um you know, doorways, uh, access to affection, access to the couch, you know, all of those things are definitely things that, um, you know, we need to take into consideration when we have a multiple dog household. Again, seniors are no exception, but some things are a little modified. Interactions between senior dogs, what that looks like, what's good and what's bad. Um, 
uh, you know, one of my favorite things, and you'll see this in a video of a dog named Mary with a dog named Gus, is <laughs> senior dog interactions. For me, it's like, kind of like watching whales, you know, that's just this more slower, graceful movement between the dogs, but it's very, it's still all there. It's still puppyhood stuff. It's just a lot slower. So what to look for in those interactions and how to manage or mitigate conflict. Um, especially when we talk about senior dogs with younger dogs as well. So let's talk about personality and what matters and what doesn't matter when we talk about multiple dog households. Now I've got my pictures of my, what I, I, I hate calling them regular dogs. It's not like the seniors aren't regular dogs, but my, um, my, I could call them my working dogs because my dogs in my house that are younger are actually, they serve a function with me, honestly, on almost a daily basis. They're coming with me for consultations. They demo for me in classes. They go to schools to demonstrate dog safety, all of that stuff. Um, and they live amongst each other as one big group. We're one big family. And I will never forget listening to Suzanne Clothier uh, talking about uh, the difference that she's found in, in when she analyzes a client looking for a dog, whether they want an orchid dog or a dandelion dog. And how does that, what does that mean? And when she explained it, I was like, this is absolutely perfect. This helps clarify so much for me what I look for when I have dogs in my multi-dog household, but also um, in understanding where some conflicts can happen between dogs. Now, I've shown you I can obviously take care of dogs with all kinds of medical issues, but I cannot keep a house plant alive for more than a week. OK, I do not have a green thumb. Um, you know, you can give me a kitten found on the side of the road that needs like whatever, and I will bring that kitten back to life. But a plant, forget it. Even cacti, they just don't survive under me. <laughs> OK, so when I heard this plant analogy, it really, really sat with me. So. Anyone ever had an orchid or if you've ever been given an orchid as a gift, they're absolutely beautiful. But if you read the instructions that come with an orchid, they are incredibly complex plants to keep alive. Like you've got to give them an ice cube every three days, keep them at this position to the sun, read to them, you know, this type of thing. It's just, they're just like an incredibly complex. They need a certain parameters in order to thrive and do well. And dogs also come in that in that category as well. Like I know a lot of orchid dogs, dogs that need a specific amount of exercise. They need this kind of setup. They need this kind of thing. And that in when those parameters are met, they thrive. And then there are dandelions, right? Dandelions are weeds that literally can thrive anywhere. We see them grow through the cracks in New York City sidewalks. They'll grow in the back of your truck if you leave a little bit of dirt in there. Um, they really can thrive under any and all parameters. And that's what makes them so successful. They're sort of like anywhere you go, you'll find this weed. And I find that there are a lot of dandelion dogs as well. Dandelion dogs are just the more easygoing. If they aren't in a certain parameter, it doesn't mean they won't thrive, right? They can still thrive under those kinds of changes. And so when I look at my group of dogs here in pictures, I look at a mix of mostly dandelions with a few orchids thrown in. Now, what would an orchid dog look like? Well, an orchid dog could be a dog that has a specific thing like resource guarding. That dog does not like to share his or her resources going near the bed when they're on it. They might get grumbly. They don't like a bone being taken from them or another dog walking by them while they're chewing on a bone. You know, that could be a an orchid dog, you know, mild orchid dog. Um, or another kind of orchid would be a dog that, you know, if they are sleeping and they are startled or they, you know, that kind of thing, they come out of it very, very hot. Like, again, certain parameters, dogs that need more exercise than others. And so when I look at my dogs today, when I am bringing in dogs or, um, you know, managing things, I'm really looking for those dandelion dogs because the more dandelions, the less the orchids can really, really sort of um, make things difficult. If you have 12 orchid dogs that all need specific parameters, it can actually make it so that you literally feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time. Whereas if you have, like in my case, you know, nine dandelions with two orchids, right? It makes it a lot easier because you're only worrying about those two orchids. The dandelions take everything in stride. And that's really the way that I look at 
structuring my groups of dogs, especially when it comes to my senior dog gangs. So something that I am constantly looking at when I'm looking at intaking a senior or hospice dog is the parameters are, they have to be a dandelion if they're going to thrive here. They have to be good with other dogs. They have to be good with cats. They have to be okay, certainly with some resource sharing. They don't have to love everything and they don't have to want other dogs to sit next to them all the time, but they have to have less parameters for thriving than what you would call some other, what we would call orchid dogs. Does that make sense? I hope I'm like being more as clear as I can. So then we have, you know, um, even more of these dogs. And I'm just going to go through with my, these senior dogs I have right now, some of their, which ones are orchids, which ones are dandelions. So Fletch right here, he is a uh, Shih Tzu. He's the blind and the deaf one. And he is a dandelion through and through. Um, even though he is blind and deaf and he has some physical issues, he does not mind at all sharing his space. He is not a resource guarder. He gets along well with anybody and everything. He loves being pet in all his areas. Like he is just absolutely fine. Um, when you look at Mr. Jackson here, this puggle, the 16 year old puggle, he is absolutely an orchid, but only a partial orchid because he um, is fine with dogs, kids, cats but he resource guards. He doesn't like to share wet food of any in, in any way, shape, or form. So that's actually a fairly easy orchid behavior to work around because that means that I can manage his environment, which I'll talk about next. Then I've got dogs like Mr. Terrence. Terrence is an orchid, uh, a dandelion through and through, good with kids, cats, other dogs, no resource guarding. Uh, the only thing that he does is he pees on everything. Um, but that doesn't really make him his parameters of living with multiple dogs an issue, only when when he did once lift his leg on another dog. Um, and that was not fun. Um, then we have Mary here. Now, Mary is one, um, a definitely an orchid, um, but I took her on knowing that the majority of my dogs were already dandelions. She uh, was a used as a breeding female, so she did not do well with other male dogs really in her space right away. And she really didn't do well with high arousal. If other dogs were playing or barking, it made her feel like she had to control the environment a lot. So one thing that we had to do for her was manage the environment environment and lower arousal, which again, I'm going to show you with environments in just a little bit. Um, but these are the kinds of things that I like people when they've got multi-dog households and they may be dealing with some issues to think about. Look at your dogs individually and say, yeah, you're definitely a dandelion. Everything rolls off your back, but you're kind of an orchid. You don't share your toys well. You definitely don't like it when you're on the couch and another dog tries to jump on the couch because those are the things that you need to be keeping in mind to put all those puzzle pieces together. Um, something that I hear a lot about in multi-dog households and multi-dog, um, you know, clients that come to me and especially people ask me all the time, you know, when they come in to visit the senior dogs, well, who's the alpha, right? Who's this and who's that? And, um, I'm here to tell you that that's, that is not how, um, they, the dogs structure themselves at all. That is actually a, a complex and a myth that we project onto these multiple senior, uh, multiple households, whether they're senior or not. Um, I look at my multi-dog household. So if you put everyone together, there's 26 dogs here, um, which sounds insane when I say it out loud, because you really wouldn't know uh, when you were walking in, but there's no, there's not a pack. Okay. They're social animals. They are, they thrive off of the interactions with one another, but they're my kids. So they are social creatures, but they're not pack animals and there's no dog above the other. This is especially important in senior dog households because a lot of senior dogs are going to have um, certain ailments or uh, disabilities that means that they need to be attended to first. So for example, with Fletch, who's blind and deaf, I need to carry him out and in uh, to go to the bathroom. And so I'll do that with him separately, or he gets fed at a certain time in a certain environment. And he usually gets fed three or four times a day and the other dogs don't. And that doesn't make Fletch higher ranking or anything like that. It's just, it's an even playing field. Um, but I'm the parent. 
Okay. And there's lots of redirection and boundaries, just like with my two children. And it's based on manners and mutual respect. Now, that is much easier to do when you have multi dandelion households versus multi orchid households. Um, and I'm completely aware of that. However, even when I'm dealing with orchid dogs, dogs that have those certain parameters, I am not. Um, going and helping that dog with those parameters so that that dog feels like they are the alpha. So we really want to get rid of that idea when we're talking about multiple dog households or quite frankly, dogs in general, um, because it's really not the way that it works. It's not how it sticks. Um, but when you're talking about multiple dog households, environment to me is one of the most important things that we can discuss and talk about um, because it's something that we often miss um, completely. We think that we're focusing on a dog guarding a bone when in actual fact, when I get a video of what a home looks like, I'm like, this has nothing to do with this kind of resource. It actually has everything to do with the way the environment is set up. Now, this is important with senior dogs because those of you that have senior dogs or hospice dogs, um, and, and I have both, know that environmental considerations for their movement, for their quality of life are really, really important. Um, but something that happens with senior dogs a lot is that they, again, they slow down um, and they can have a harder time navigating through certain things or also um, figuring out how to defer with younger dogs. So senior dogs can get themselves in trouble a lot more when they're losing their sight or they're starting to have more issues with their mobility because they can't manipulate in the environment the way that they used to be able to. Um, so it's really important that we keep some of these things in mind. And the, the big ones that I like to keep, you know, at the forefront of everyone's brain with multiple dogs is something called a grumble zone and a growl zone. And this comes from Jen Triok, uh family paws. You know, we talk a lot about this with, um, you know, dogs and kids and toddlers, but it applies in multiple dog households as well. So What's a grumble zone? Well, a grumble zone is an area of tight space where dogs are sort of forced to go through a space together. So I've got some images here. You know, this was at my old house because we only moved a couple of months ago. Um, this was our classic grumble zone. So we lived in this ranch with this fully finished, um, you know, upstairs and downstairs, but there were these hallways. Now, if I had three senior dogs sort of napping right here and another senior dog wanted to walk through to get to me to come stalk me, God forbid I went to the bathroom alone or anything like that, those dogs were all sort of bottlenecked very close together. And that's a grumble zone. It's a grumble zone is where they can escape one another, but they are forced into close proximity. Um, the best way to describe a grumble zone for us as human beings is going down a shopping aisle on a Saturday with your shopping cart and trying to squeeze through other people, <laughs> right? Even if you don't touch them, but they're right there, you're like, just let me get through. So that's a grumble zone. And grumble zones are pretty much everywhere in our home. You know, if you, once you start looking at them, you'll be like, oh, big grumble zone is the coffee table versus the couch. So that couch, and then you've got the coffee table right in front and you'll have a dog that's sort of sitting with you. And then the other dog comes around and they're sort of trapped between them, but they've got to move around things to get out. That's a grumble zone. Your dining room table or your kitchen island, again, anything that bottlenecks, those are classified as grumble zones. And then we have our growl zones. Now, growl zones are areas where the dogs can't escape or they're much more limited in their escape route. So a growl zone, I've got a picture of all these kids um, laying on the couch, but like, you know, Lucy right here on the couch laying, um, that is almost a growl zone for her because if there's a dog right here and there's a dog right here and she's pushed on, another dog puts physical pressure on her, um, even just not even touching her, but just moves too close, she has really not a lot of places to escape or go to. Now, this is really important for senior dogs as well, because when we add in physical limitations, such as a dog that's painful and getting up in moving, and maybe a grumble zone then turns into a growl zone because the dog can't get that space that he wants or can't as readily get the space as he used to. Or when you're dealing with a uh, young dog versus a senior dog and the young dog is in a growl zone and the senior dog has no idea that he's there and continues to walk in or get into that space, 
those are considerations that you want to start thinking about when you're looking at your home with multiple dogs. Now, grumble zones also can be areas that are open, but we've added a resource. So here's a great example of this. This is why I put this here. So my, uh, this was our back door to our deck. And if I had like six of the dogs all looking out that window, getting very, very excited about a squirrel, right? There's that potential in that grumble zone. If I were to open that door and everybody tries to go out at the same time for that to suddenly become a growl zone because we've got multiple dogs highly aroused with the resource of the squirrel and that can erupt into certain things. So a grumble zone can also turn into a growl zone if you've got a dog laying in one area like right here, chewing on a bone and another dog wants to walk by. OK, so what we talk a lot about in environmental considerations with multiple dogs or kids and dogs is to open spaces up as much as possible. Now, I don't want you then to go get a sledgehammer and start knocking all your walls down. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying when you start to have multiple dogs, um, especially senior dogs with multiple ailments, opening spaces up as much as you can really can lessen a lot of those grumble and growl zone areas and stress for dogs. So that's why you'll see a lot of my spaces for my old dogs are all uh, kept as open as possible. There's a lot of free choice and ability to move um, in some of that. Now, Things like resources, which we'll talk about in a second, like beds or food, um, because my dogs are dandelions, they really do share and eat well together. Um, and there's no training involved in this type of thing, guys. All, the, all of these dogs come to me as seniors or super seniors hospice dogs. I just take on these dogs that I know are orchids so that they can have this kind of lifestyle together. Um, it's very, very different when I first brought Miss May. Marion, who I'm circling my mouse over here, who was very grumble and growl zone sensitive when she first came. She'd been used as a breeding female, scars all over her uh, from uh, being chained up outside and probably force bred and that kind of thing. Um, that when she first came, I had to do a lot of environmental management and keep her behind a gate for a while until she realized that everybody around her was a dandelion and no one was going to push her buttons. Um but the reason that we're able to have this lifestyle and keep it so nicely open is because we have so many dandelion dogs that don't feed off of one another. Now, when we talk about resources with multiple dogs and senior dogs as well, this applies to, uh, we're talking about things like food, right? Guarding of their food dishes. Um, anyone who has a uh, multiple dog household has probably dealt with this at least at one point where you have a dog that does not like to share. Um, space. Space is a huge resource, especially when we talk about, again, dogs that are suddenly going down into the sunset of their life and feeling more vulnerable. Um, their, their feeling of space and security, they may be much more apt to not get up and move like they used to or what we call defer. So they may absolutely be more guardy of that space. Uh, resources of people. Um, if you've ever had a, uh, a dog that's been sitting on your lap and the other dog walks over and <laughs> the dog on your lap goes, eh, you're like, okay, you're guarding me. Um, I'm as, I'm as valuable as a bowl of food, you know, which I kind of take as a compliment, but still, um, so, you know, we can be a resource. Toys can absolutely be a resource, obviously, depending on the value and depending on your dog. And then arousal, like I was talking about at that door. So can arousal be a resource? Absolutely. Arousal or access to that resource can absolutely be something that causes some things to get uh, a little tense. And every dog is going to have their own limits, right? And limitations and tolerances and management and redirection is really, really important. And yes, this goes for senior dogs as well, although it's more complex when you're dealing with dogs that have physical disabilities like they can't hear, because it's not as easy if you see two dogs, you know, chewing on a bone and they start to have a little bit of a physical um, interaction where one is growling, but the other one can't hear <laughs> and you have to step in, but how do you step in when that's going on? That's all the sorts of things that you want to take into consideration. That means that maybe if I 
can't open this space up. Maybe when I give these dogs bones and I've got one dog that is typically a dandelion, but is blind and deaf and won't pick up on the other dog's signals, I need to put them behind a gate or separate them completely. Um, and something that I try to let everybody know, and this is so important with uh, our multiple dog households, is that trigger stacking absolutely matters. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the term trigger stacking, but briefly what I'll do is I'll, uh, trigger stacking as an example would be if I had a very stressful email from work that really, you know, set me off and that right before I had to go home. And then the way home, I realized that I was out of gas, stopped at a gas station, but the pump didn't work. So I had to drive to the next gas station, finally got that pump to work. Um, as I was putting the pump back, spilled gasoline all over me, um, pulled into my driveway. And um, as I got out, stubbed my toe, walked into the the door and my husband said, hi, honey, how was your day? And I just snapped at him. What that is, is it's not me being this unpredictable monster person that the, the, my husband may very much view as it's all those triggers, a bad email, gas station, not working pump, spilling gas all over me, stubbing my toe. And you put all of those things combined and you get this eruption. And we see this with dogs a lot, right? So if we have an old dog who's feeling very painful and, um, you know, maybe has just started really showing us those signs. So we haven't gotten him on the right meds yet or anything like that. Um, uh, and he just had a vet visit for a poke and he's got a very high value bone that he absolutely loves. And your other dog walks past him and he erupts and barks and loses his mind at him. It might feel very unpredictable, but there's actually probably a lot of stacking that's been going on. And I do see um, for old dogs that sometimes these triggers can be building up over time, especially when we take medical considerations um, into play as well. So now I'm going to show you, I'm wondering how I'm doing on time. Oh, I'm doing okay. Uh, there's a lot of information in a short period of time. I'm going to stop share this way and I'm going to show you some videos of some old dogs. Um, let me make sure I've got this up right properly. So I'm going to show you some cool videos of some interactions first um, of modifying um, play or dogs figuring each other out when you're dealing with one dog that has a type of handicap versus another. So I'm going to go to share screen now. Desktop. OK, cool. Kelly, you'll have to tell me, can you see that? OK, can you see my desktop? OK, yes. OK, Let's perfect. See. So I'm going to show you this very recent video that hopefully will come up. Okay, perfect. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this is Rosie. Rosie is completely blind uh, in one eye. She actually had one eye removed and her other eye has sight issues because she had chronic dry eye. She was very neglected um, and her dry eyes caused ulcers and holes to develop in her, her corneas. We ended up needing one eye removed um, and the other eye has some uh, limitations in sight, but she can still see. Uh, and she's fairly young. She's about 11 years old. Uh, she's a dandelion for the most part, except for uh, when she's eating and someone crosses by her blind side. She doesn't really like that. And she is also completely deaf. Um, and this is Gerald. <laughs> Gerald can see and hear just fine, uh, but he has some hind end issues, um, chronic pancreatitis and all that good stuff. He's much, very much a hospice case. And this was them in this very last um, snowstorm playing. And it's a really, really beautiful example of dogs learning about limitations and whatnot. So you can watch this really quickly. Can you see that okay, Kelly? Yeah. I wonder if the sound. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. I'm trying to get, see if I can get the sound to work, but it's not working. <laughs> this is a beautiful example of Gerald going like, well, wait a second. You stopped. I, I don't understand. understand. It's because she can't hear him. <laughs> 
Um, but you know, when you watch these, for me, when I watch these videos, it's really, really fascinating to watch multiple dogs with all different ailments, figuring out who's capable of what. So there she, he is barking at her and she, he started to figure out very quickly in this, I've got to stay on this side of you. That's the only way that I'm actually going to get to continue these interactions, uh, which was really, really cool. He, <laughs> um, so he very quickly realized that if he stayed on his her left side, they could continue playing. Um, and we don't give our dogs nearly enough credit that they can figure that out, right? That they can start to learn, like, there's another dog with a physical disability. I've got to figure this, um, got to work with you on this way. I'm going to find another one of good play here. Uh, here we go. Here we can watch this one. Oh, no, that's not play, but you can at least see multi-dogs together. So in this video here, I don't know if you can see in the crate, this was during Mary's decompression time. So she had come in and she, like I said, she was really not used to being able to share. She was very, very much an orchid. Um, and so when we brought her in, I had to modify the environment and make sure that she was set up to not feel that she um, had to guard or feel like her space was going to be invaded at all. Once she realized that the other dogs were going to get out of her way and you could see in that video, everyone just sort of hanging out and doing their thing. Over time, she really, really came around. And I'm just trying to find this one fantastic video of her playing with, um, with Gus. Hold on a second for me. I will come up. It must be, is it this one? Yes, here we go. Trying to sit on his head. <laughs> there you go. There you go. She's like, let's play. Poor Gus. Mary. So I'm going to pause it here and just have you watch this for a second because you're going to see Rita. This is Rita and renal failure Rita, we call her. She's 14. Um, she does a beautiful thing called splitting. So, but watch, the reason I love watching senior dog, multi-dog senior interactions, like this is so much slower than it would be if all these dogs were a year old, right? Like Mary is being pushy and she's trying to get play, but her version of pushy at this age being 14 and with her, all of her issues is much more tolerable and able to be dealt with. Um, then if she were, imagine if she were a year and a half old doing this to him, I would have to step up and move into that right away. But just, just watch this. So cute. <laughs> Mary, come here. He just got here, honey. You guys can play tomorrow. He's tired. There's Rita doing a split Girl, where she's yeah. like, you guys figure this out somewhere else, please. Yeah. And then she goes, I'm going to just shred this bed then. You remember when you were a grumpy Gus? Could you not, please? I just made that bed. <laughs> so it's a great example, though, of after she settled in, once she was given the right environmental concessions and she real and with the right group of dogs, she really did start to become a much more her parameters got a lot wider. She no longer was nearly as. Um, stressed about sharing resources or having dogs in her space or even meeting new dogs. Um, and I use that, and Mary is a wonderful example of, um, you know, old dogs can absolutely in the right circumstances get definite behavior change and modification. And one of the other reasons that I think multi-senior dog households can be so beneficial for the other dogs, because Mary being with these older dogs that all were like, yeah, whatever, we've been there, done that. We're not interested in playing or getting right in your face. 
helped her feel a lot more comfortable versus putting her into a home with seven or not even seven, but like two other large, excitable young dogs. She never would have made the strides that she made. I'm going to show you this video here too, really quick. I know we, you're going to want to open up for questions soon, but this is Bear. Um, and many of the videos of the dogs I'm showing you guys have passed on. They came to me as hospice, but they give you some great examples. Now, Bear was the largest dog that we had ever taken in. He was dumped on the side of the road, uh, covered in matting. We got him shaved, brought him in. Um, and he was like 135 pounds. He was like a great Pyrenees German shepherd thing. He was massive. And he was a great example just from what, I just want you to watch this movement with him. Uh, because when he came, he took up so much space that everything around him became a grumble zone. So he was like a dining room table size. So I also knew that with his size, he couldn't get up and move away as quickly as he may have wanted to. So I had to take a lot of that into consideration when having him interact with my young dogs. I just want you to see the movement that he shows that when I look at that, I automatically take that into consideration that I'm then going to have to modify things and not expect him to be able to get up and get out of the way or move. This is how big this boy is. What you doing, bud? What you doing? Like a, having a polar bear in my dining room, guys. I mean, I swear to God, he was so big. No one believed me until they would meet him. And they're like, oh my God, he's massive. But watch how slow he moves, right? So he's not going to be able in a multi-dog household. Good boy. Okay. <laughs> the drool. But once he settled, right, even if I had if I had a blind senior that was walking through that space that bumped into him, Bear was way too big, way too sore to be able to get up and move out of that. So everything then, the environment, everything then changed. And that, that's really important to keep in mind when you're dealing with multi-senior dog households, um, especially if you have the turnover that I do. You know, one group that I have um, that I've got a really nice setup for can suddenly shift dramatically in all the considerations I have to make just based on the dog size or the dog's physical limitations and what that's going to create in terms of grumble zones and growl zones. Um, and I will end it with a couple of just really, the, here's, this is a great one um, of multi-senior dogs, these two ladies. Um, and this is where I'm so thankful that a lot of my senior dogs are deaf because they don't get to pick up on the bad behaviors of the dogs that aren't deaf. This is Bella and Snuggles. What? We're just having lunch. That's not how you ask politely. Oh, how Snuggles is deaf. Snuggles so deaf. That's no idea. <laughs> That's not how you ask. That's not nice. That's I, nice. I don't do that. <laughs> So we have a lot of that. You know, we have some dogs that have the pushiest, most obnoxious barks. They bark at everything. And the other ones that are deaf, thank God, just sleep through it or don't pick up on that behavior at all. Those of you that have multiple senior dogs with regular dogs and the senior dogs are, this is Bella, my the puggle, who was extremely pushy for food and would scream at you no matter when you were eating. Um, some of my younger dogs started to pick up on that. That was fun. Um, so we had to make a lot of considerations in switching things around. But Little Miss Snuggles here, 16, who was deaf as a post and in renal failure, had no concept that there was all this noise being made. Um, and that definitely helped lessen stress, right? Because she didn't pick up on the arousal that Bella was creating from some of that stuff. All right. So I've talked your ear off now for 40, 48 minutes. I'm going to let Kelly open up for some questions. I'll stop, share. I could share videos of the old dogs all day. But Kelly, go ahead if you have anything you want to add. Well, Helen, I think that most of the 50 of us on the call right now would stay all day. So <laughs> there would not be a problem there. But uh, first of all, Helen, uh, Chris had dropped in chat and a few others, you know, and we all 
echo the sentiments of saying thank you so much for giving them all such a wonderful life. It's just terrific. We have much appreciated oh, and you're welcome. what a special, special person you are and your family is for, for taking care of these amazing seniors. Kat was wondering, do some dandelions turn into orchids as they age and develop pain or disability? Yes. That's such a great question. Um, and yes, Kat, they absolutely can sometimes just because of their breed. So like, it, for example, you might have a very much a dandelion German shepherd puppy. And then by the time they're three, they're an orchid because they've matured into their genetic breed specific behaviors. But um, for age re reasons, absolutely. You can get a dog that was usually very easygoing, had no issues for the first nine years of their life, developed arthritis or cancer or something. And that immediately shifts their tolerance and inability and their parameters change. And you could say the same for us, right? I mean, this happens to uh, us as adults and as, as we age as well, that things that we were able to enjoy or tolerate really shift. So to answer your question, absolutely. And then the funny thing is, Kat, is that it can sometimes go the other way around. Like I, again, like the video of Mary, Mary at at six years old probably never could have eventually lived in a home with 12 other dogs in that room. She just couldn't. I could from her personality, but she um, because of her age and her seniorness, she just didn't have the same level of energy or to be as pissed off as she used to be. So she was able to uh, really go into more dandelion with the right parameter set. So that's a great question. Yes, thank you. For, thank you for answering. I'm seeing a lot of the parallels between humans and uh, our, our furry doggo friends. Yeah. Heidi asks, so for that yappy dog, she says, mine is the youngest in the house. How is the best way of discouraging that pushy behavior? Well, huh. Uh, I'm the wrong one to ask because when I'm dealing with my senior and my hospice dogs, I could care less. I prob I usually just give them whatever they want, um, quite frankly. With my young dogs with that behavior, the best way to mitigate that is, quite frankly, to just get up and move away, like ignore. You know, um, the old school idea of sitting there and just letting the dog bark and bark and bark tends to cause sometimes more trouble than it solves because you end up just, bub you bubble over and go, shut up. Um, to get the dog to stop. So the best thing that I do is my dog comes and starts barking at me. I literally stand up and I go sit somewhere else. They follow me, they do it. I stand up, I go sit somewhere else. And it takes a lot of time and, and energy to do that. But if you stay consistent over a few days, the dog will realize this gets me nothing. Now on the flip side of that, when the dog finally does go settle and goes, all right, this is boring. I'm not getting anything and goes and settles down. You've got to reinforce that behavior so that there is a, a weighing of this, uh, the, the balancing of the scales, so to speak. Um, but of course, every dog is different. So, um, that, but that, that would be my first, my first course of action. And then on times when like, if I'm doing a zoom and I know that I might have a dog that might come and sit and bark in my face, I'm going to be proactive before I get on that zoom and just give the dog something to do or put them in a space to prevent some of that from me inadvertently reinforcing it. Very helpful, Helen. I'm hearing that there's as much training of the humans in the scenario as there may be. Yes. As someone asked me recently, what's the hardest animal you've ever trained? Because I've worked with multiple species. Um, and I was like, a human being. Human beings are the hardest animals to train. Right. They, they really are. You know, uh, you can use M&Ms, though. M&Ms are helpful. M&Ms work. <laughs> hey, pause. And Amanda, there, I know there are a couple more questions in our Zoom chat, but I want to pause for our Facebook Live folks. Anything coming in? I have not seen anything thus far. Okay, well, we do have a couple more questions that came in via chat. And by the way, Donna was was looking for some recommendations for a senior dog vet near Ocala, but we had mentioned that, Helen, you don't mind sharing your, your contact information for any specific questions that- Yeah. That you, you can to... you can find me on oh, olddogsgotohelen.com. Um, if you go there, you can send me a contact us form and I can uh, answer emails and inquiries there very, very easily. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ashley asks, is in the senior dog house, do you keep toys out all the time or do you limit access to toys based on orchids in the house? 
Poor great management question. is something she's working on. Yes. Yes. Great question. Um, so uh, I've put toys down, but I stop because they get peed on. Um, so uh, to answer your question, sometimes I will, I, there's a lot of times there's the, we have the antlers down or the Nyla bones and some of that stuff. Um, nothing edible. I don't leave anything edible down like that. Uh, but uh, we have, we do have some toys down, but it depends again on the group that we have and the value of the toy. Mm, okay, thank you. And Deborah says that her senior turns 15 next week and has started to nonstop bark at nothing. And she has to go get her to shut her up is it's tough because she has sundowners too. Yes. Yeah. So when you start to see that stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm not a veterinarian, that would be discussions with your vet about potentially there may be some chemical help that we can give the dog while they're going through that sundowning. Um, when it's not specific behavior based, like I'm not eating, but my dog is just barking at a wall, right. Or those kinds of things. That's what I'm getting on the phone with my veterinarians and saying, you know, what do I do and how can I treat this? Sundowning is something I see a lot with the cases that we take in. Okay. Thank you, Helen. And we will be praying, Deborah, for, for your special pup. And I think we do have time for one or two more questions. Kim says she has four seniors. The fourth she just adopted after fostering for a year. To, she chose to make an honest dog out of him after he was diagnosed with cancer she or other senior dogs by paying the new guy too much attention. Sorry, Kelly, you cut out. What was the question? I'm sorry. The, she, Kim, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Kim says that she has four seniors. The fourth she just adopted after fostering for a year. She chose to make an honest dog out of him after he was diagnosed with cancer. And she was wondering if she's hurting her other their senior dogs by paying too much attention to the new guy. If she's hurting her senior dogs, other dogs by paying attention, is that the right question? Okay. Um, to, to answer your question, no. Um, you know, when I bring in, I, I always know, like by bringing in another senior dog, am I um, hurting the attention that I can give the other senior dogs by helping them? And the answer to that usually to me is, is no. The benefits far, far outweigh that. Um, you know, I, I say, uh, as long as your other dog's needs are being met and you can take an extra minute for each of them, I think that that's absolutely fine. You are not hurting them in that way. Just like if my daughter, if my five-year-old is sick and I have to spend a lot of time paying attention to her, it doesn't mean I love my 12-year-old any less. It's just who needs what at that moment. Um, and that's how I really help myself feel, um, like I'm still giving them what they need, even if it's not just one or all at the same time. Thank you, Helen. It's a beautiful answer. And I think it's almost like we're all here as a support to one another too. We see a lot, a lot of comments in chat talking about those of us who have seniors who've suffered from dementia or we've lost them. And one final question and any others, please do reach out to Helen via her website, old dogs go to heaven, Helen. Helen. Com. Yep. <laughs> but, but Kat said she is trying to incorporate a two-year-old with seniors hmm. and the two two-year-old is still learning manners aside from lots of exercise and gates any other pointers um so with a two-year-old incorporating them you know i'm a huge fan of uh cat tethering indoor tethering i don't use that with um my senior dogs because frankly they don't need it gates and and crates tend to be who i go to but indoor tethering is like giving a dog a, a three foot four foot indoor tether where they can hang out on that space um and then the senior dogs have the opportunity to interact with that young dog as they'd like to, um, but be able to move away. And because of the tether, it allows the young dog to be a part of the space, but not um, be able to practice a lot of negative behaviors. So I use a lot of indoor tethering when I'm talking about small dogs and big dogs getting along or cats and young puppies and that kind of thing. Um, PetTethers.com is a great place to go learn about tethering. Um, and it's something that I teach to a lot of other dog trainers in our industry, just because again, it's a really fantastic management tool. So that's what I would look into starting doing some tether training and utilizing that. Wonderful. Thanks again, Helen. A couple announcements before we close today. But first of all, on behalf of the Gray Muzzle family and all of us lovers of senior dogs across the country, 
industry and across the world because Hazel was joining us from the United Kingdom, which is pretty cool. So thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for sharing your information, for being educational, informative, entertaining, for sharing so many great tips and for the work that you do. We really, really appreciate it. The world needs more people like you, Helen, and may we all be inspired by your actions. So oh, thank, thank you, you so Kelly. much. Thank you so by much. By the way, you're very welcome. Thank you. And to all of the group out there, Helen is going to be back for another webinar in April to discuss anxiety in senior dogs. So we are already looking forward to that. So be sure to go to Helen's website, olddogsgotohelen.com. A couple other quick announcements. The time you've all been waiting for, our 2023 grant cycle opens on February 13th. And we are hosting a webinar on February 15th to answer all of your questions. So if you or someone you know works or volunteers for any type of animal welfare organization that serves senior dogs, please let them know. And you can find a wealth of grant related information on our website, graymuzzle.org under the grants tab. This is the one time of year that we open the grant cycle. So it's, it's now to, to get in to apply for a grant. We would love to be able to award even more than what we did in 2022. Our next webinar is Thursday, February 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern time, where we welcome veterinarian Dr. Julie Busby, who will be here to talk to us about 10 favorite things for senior dogs. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you again, Helen. Thank everybody out in this uh, virtual world here on Facebook and on Zoom for your support and generosity in ensuring that every senior dog thrives and no old dog dies alone and afraid. We'll see you next time. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Helen. Welcome, bye. Bye-bye.